Hi, welcome to this episode of the Scottish History Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chris. And I'm Peter. This episode is part one of a two-part series about Scottish commerce in the past. This first one focuses on uh, the 18th century tobacco trade between Scotland and the colonies in America. Okay, so in 1700, Scotland was one of the poorer nations in Europe. Fast forward up to 1850, and it's one of the most developed nations on Earth. One of the questions that historians debate is, how did this happen? Well, it didn't happen overnight, and there isn't one source for the change. The classic academic answer being, it's complicated. Out of the evidence, some compelling theories have been built to explain Scotland's transformation from a relative backwater to a booming centre of modernity. And here, we're going to explore the role of the humble tobacco leaf in that process. So our main sources for this episode are works by Tom Devine. The first book is Scotland's Empire, and the second is The Tobacco Lords. These are the sources of our facts and figures, and of the theories of how Glasgow's merchants built up their share of the tobacco trade. So if you're keen, definitely check out these books. The time frame for this episode is between 1700 and 1775. Just before Scotland and England combined to form Great Britain in 1707, up to just before the Declaration of Independence was signed in the American colonies in 1776. Between these 75 years, an entire sector of economic activity was conjured into being out of a combination of the growing colonies in the Americas and the enterprise of domestic merchants, especially those in the west of the country around Glasgow. The market was the tobacco trade. An entire supply chain was constructed around this, and more and more of the growing value in tobacco leaf was claimed by Scots merchants. So the situation was like this. After the Scottish and English parliaments combined to form Britain, Scottish merchants now had access to the markets of what had been the English Empire, but which was now the British Empire. This included colonies in America like Virginia. Across the 1700s, the colonies would be a source for trade in raw materials and a destination for British manufactured goods. Throughout the century, the colonies are a growing place, from 200,000 people in 1700 to 2 million people by 1770. That's averaging out to an increase of about 30 to 40 percent year on year, which is amazing. An important part of that process was tobacco, uh, which is something known as a cash crop. Spices, sugar, cotton, tobacco, these are all cash crops. Colonists would clear land, grow tobacco leaf, they'd dry it, bundle it, uh, and then a middleman would transport the leaf across the Atlantic to Europe, where throughout the 1700s, tobacco had developed into a staple consumer item for Europeans of all classes. And there he would sell it, take his share, and repeat the process. The Glasgow merchants competed their way into being that middleman between the planter and the European smoker. So Peter, what, what is the European smoker in this time? Well, there's a few there's a few different types of tobacco. So you've got your normal tobacco leaf, which you can, which gets crushed up. You can put it into a pipe and you can smoke it or you can roll it in paper, smoke it like a cigarette. That's the most common way we know today of smoking. Mm -hmm. There's also something called snuff, which was tobacco ground up very, very finely. And it was usually put on your finger and you snorted it to get the, the nicotine hit. Really? Wow. Yeah. But that was kind of reserved for the more kind of upper class. Um, just the process was a lot longer to make snuff. Okay. So it cost a lot more. So it was it was a status symbol. Sure. If you had snuff, you were you were the big cheese. You had a lot of money. So mo most people, you said, so people are using cigarettes to smoke. I thought they had used pipes. They used pipes as well. Um, in America, actually, there was quite a big industry for pipe production. Yeah. So you would imagine that a lot of people would have used pipes. But again, I think it seemed like more which kind of class you you fell into dictated how you smoked your tobacco or how you used your tobacco yeah that's cool yeah so when you're high up you didn't you didn't smoke it you sniffed it mm -hmm. you, you um kind of middle you know you'd use a pipe yeah. but then you are kind of general kind of lower class people they would be generally smoking either cigarettes or pipes as well through a combination of luck cleverness and rule bending glasgow's share of the growing trade in the transatlantic tobacco would increase across the century from 10% in 1738 to 40% in the market by 1765. These guys did this in an environment of competition. Other British cities, mainly Bristol, Liverpool, Whitehaven and London, were all competitors with Glasgow. In 1738, these cities all had a high share of tobacco trade pie chart. Success was never guaranteed. One of the most interesting questions is what the merchants did with the money they made from the colonial trading. One idea is that they poured it into estates so they could look cool. 
Another is that much of it was reinvested into improvement, into industry and infrastructure. Um, I mean, today in Glasgow, you can still see the part of their legacy. Uh, I'm in the city centre a lot, I walk in there, and every time, well, Merchant City, part of the city centre, is named after the tobacco merchants. The Centre for Modern Art, that actually used to be one of their houses. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of street names as well. Like There's the, the main street, uh, Buchanan Street, he mm -hmm. was a yeah. tobacco lord. And just you know, merchants in general, like um, Jamaica Street, there's Glassford Street, John Glassford, he was another tobacco lord. Cool. There's just, yeah, there's, there's, there's more than you think, actually, yeah, in it's Glasgow. Yeah, it's interesting, like, when you're kind of walking around, it'll be the same in every city mm -hmm. in the world, basically. There are these kind of old stories that are kind of, like, hidden in the streets yeah. and, like, the way things are built. The St. Andrew's Church as well um, in Trongate, just by the East End, that's also, that was funded by Tobacco Lord Money, mm. which is actually, it's a beautiful building. Um, so go look it up if you can. But again, yeah, it's funded by Tobacco Lords. Um, but yeah, like, on my on my way to uh, Central Station, um, riding my bike, I, I sometimes go along the uh, the Clyde Forth Canal. And that was another, like, piece of equipment that was uh, invested into by um, people who had derived income from the tobacco trade. Um, the idea being they wanted to take the barrels of tobacco and be able to get them over to the Forth River, which was a better path, which had better access to like Scandinavia and Germany, where you could you'd be able to sell the stuff. But when I get to the station, uh, I take a train and I, I go over to a town called Greenock, and on the way I pass this town called Port Glasgow, and that was a town that was custom built by Glasgow merchants. Um, in the late uh, the late uh, 17th century, in the 1600s, that was a port that was custom built to give merchants in Glasgow access to the Atlantic markets. A ship at dock in Port Glasgow in 1750 could be unloading all kinds of goods. A range of products were swirling around a globally connected Europe. Wine, sugar, rum, linens, which is a kind of fabric, tea, chocolate, timber. There's a good chance it would be unloading tobacco from the American colonies. Off the ship, the tobacco would then be weighed by customs officials. This weight would determine the amount of tax to be paid on the leaf. And then off it went, down the supply chain, to the final consumer. It's here at the weighing that we meet one of Glasgow's competitive edges, smuggling. There are lots of different parts of the smuggling process, but the part of the process that happened in Port Glasgow uh, took to do with the weighing. So what would happen is uh, a barrel of tobacco would come off the ship and then it would be, it would be weighed. Um, and as an example, they had the tax. The tax was called the old subsidy, and it would float around 1p. You would pay 1 pence per pound of tobacco imports. Right, so the barrel would hit the scale, and it would read 20 pounds. But the customs official would write down 18 pounds. And so you would pay, in Glasgow, you would pay 18 pence of taxes instead of paying 20. So you've saved 2 pence per pound of tobacco. And then over millions of pounds of tobacco, that would turn out to be a lot of money so that you could lower the price of tobacco that the customer would face and so that you would end up with an advantage in the European markets. It's estimated that between 1739 and 1748, as much as 22% of the tobacco moving through Scotland was smuggled. This smuggling bonus would shrink in importance over time as officialdom caught up with it. Moving in the opposite direction of the tobacco into the ship was a wide range of goods for sale to the colonists in America. Stuff like farming equipment, glass, paper, books, clothing, alcohol, processed sugar, anything the colonists wanted that Scottish merchants could get their hands on to sell. And here we meet another of Glasgow's edges, effectively meeting colonial demand for stuff they can't make in America. In that time, the economy of America looked to Europe. If you needed a plow or the newest fashion, you needed European merchants. This demand for products was in the minds of colonial planters. They wanted to sell their tobacco, and in exchange, buy the stuff they needed and wanted. If you could sell their tobacco and give them access to European goods, you would have an advantage. At first, merchants in the west of Scotland met this by importing goods from around Europe and the world into the Clyde. The Clyde is the river that's home to Greenock, Glasgow, and Port Glasgow. They would then re-export these goods into America. Demand for these goods soon exceeded Scottish capacity. This was described by a contemporary at the time. Quote, there were not manufacturers sufficient, either there, meaning Glasgow, or at Paisley, to supply an outward-bound cargo for Virginia. For this purpose, they were obliged to have recourse to Manchester. Manufacturers were in their infancy. And that was a quote from a guy called Alexander Carlyle, who was a student at Glasgow Uni in the 1740s. Transport and the salaries of middlemen 
stacked additional costs onto the final product. And so there was an incentive to produce the goods in Scotland in the first place. And so over time, the domestic manufacturing scene adapted to meet American consumer demand. Infrastructure like coal mines and water mills were built to power new manufactories, which turned out goods like paper, sugar, glass, and tools. I listened to this podcast from, it's on iTunes, if you look for it, put in Joanne Freeman, American Revolution. In her lecture series, she talks about how, just kind of offhand, she, she mentions how one of her colleagues is doing research on the products that were going from the British Isles to the American colonies, and her colleague is doing research on the quality of it. And she's finding that often, or her thesis is that a lot of the goods that were sent to the colonies were shoddy, or like second rate. Yes, yeah, last month's fashion, last year's fashion. Yeah, yeah. You know, if it's get the old one. Just send it to Virginia. Right? Yeah. They don't know. Can, yeah, they have exactly. no idea. Yeah. You know, they're, they're out in the country bumping. Yeah, they're out in the have no idea that this corset or whatever is. is just not in fashion at all. Mm-hmm. Or like some, I don't know, widget. This is broken. Like, eh, put it on the ship. Sells yeah. to the colonists. Yeah, <laughs> they'll take it. <laughs> like, chuck it on. Yeah. <laughs> this is, again, this is what could have got my understanding of tobacco laws to just be a little bit... Yeah. Not not very nice. I mean, they can't really have thought much of the American platters if they're really willing to rip them off this much and just make yeah. a profit. Off. Well, see, I hear that. I think I still think it, I still think it's funny. It's it's amusing to us now, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, to a Virginia planner who gets broken item, like yeah. you know, a broken yeah. tool, you can imagine he's sitting there, he's getting in for the winter, goes to use his hammer, the head snaps off. Dang <laughs> <laughs> like, kind of it! <laughs> But you would want to get them good products because if you could get them a good hammer, then you would be able to, they would sell you their tobacco. Mm. You know, otherwise, if you couldn't get them good products, they might go to somebody else. So the ship is stocked up, the cargo is securely packed, and we're setting off on the 7,000 mile round trip to Virginia. The trip itself rhymes with another part, or better, the steel casing of the merchant system in the west of Scotland, the British Empire. Union with England had created a new country called Britain. Being a partner in this entitled Scotland to protection by the Royal Navy, and at a time where pirates literally roamed the seas and the potential for war with France was never far away, the shield of empire created a breathing space for the pursuit of commerce. Within this frame of British cannons and muskets, Scottish merchants added detail to their market advantage in the tobacco trade by refining transport efficiency. More and more, the ships being used were directly owned by Scottish merchants. In the early days of the trade, most ships were rented by Glasgow merchants to carry goods from one side of the Atlantic to the other. At the opening of 1700, most ships leaving the Clyde were chartered, and by 1775, 90% of the fleet was operated directly from Glasgow. Often, these vessels were American-built, meaning that they were specially designed to make the Atlantic crossing. The scale of the ships also grew, driving down transport costs by increasing the value per sailing. This was important because ships at the time, depending on sails and seasonal wind patterns, on average could only achieve two round trips per year. And so this massive piece of equipment, a commercial sailing ship, only paid for itself twice a year. Every square foot of space in a vessel would have mattered. The tobacco merchants of Glasgow also had an additional advantage unrelated to their skills in commerce, geography. Scotland's position in the north of Europe, combined with prevailing wind patterns, made Glasgow, via an approach north of Ireland, the closest major British port to the American colonies in the 1700s. As a Glasgow-owned tobacco ship, heavy with cargo, both manufactured in Glasgow and imported to the Clyde from around Europe, made its way across the Atlantic to America. Another part of the Glasgow tobacco business model was busy at work in Virginia. In 1750, the colony of Virginia was a center of tobacco production. As mentioned earlier, This cash crop was an important commodity Americans traded with Europe to make a living. As time passed, planters worked their way further into Virginia, following the rivers that flowed in the opposite direction, past cities like Richmond and Norfolk, down into the Chesapeake River, which connected the expanding tobacco plantations with Europe and with the River Clyde in Scotland. Across the 1700s, startup planters fanned out across Virginia to farm the leaf and make a living for themselves. Over time, the best land was taken and the marginal land came into development. More farmers entered the market, and the average size of plantations began to fall. It's in this context of increasing numbers of planters and shrinking farm sizes that the Glasgow tobacco merchants cultivated yet another market edge over their competitors in Bristol and London. Most of the British tobacco merchants followed a business model described as the consignment system. The way this worked is that a merchant was hired by a planter to transport his tobacco to Europe. 
where the merchant was expected to search for and sell at the highest price. The merchant was encouraged to do this because he made his living on the commissions from the tobacco sales. The planter held ownership of the leaf up to final sale. The Glasgow tobacco firms tended to follow a different business model. This was described as a direct purchase system. It worked like this. Out in the Virginia hinterland, where newer and smaller plantations were being set up, Scottish tobacco firms would establish tobacco storehouses. Planters in the surrounding area could come to these storehouses and sell a tobacco crop directly to a firm, instead of hiring a merchant to ship the tobacco to Europe and sell it in his name. Within this system, the tobacco heading to Europe was owned entirely by the merchant. It's kind of like the difference between eBay and Amazon today. The consignment system, more popular with larger planters and merchants in London, is like eBay, with the company as a middleman. Direct purchase, more common among Glasgow firms and the newer, smaller planters, is more similar to the Amazon model, where Amazon sells in bulk as the owner, but the product has been produced by someone else. As a note, it's important to mention that slavery was a major lever of the trade. Those guys setting up tobacco plantations in Virginia needed credit to buy plows, but they also needed credit to buy slaves. Credit which Scottish-based tobacco houses were an important source of. In Scottish history, there is a strand of thought which argues that Scottish imperialism was free from the stain of slavery, that Scots earned their living with free commerce and ingenuity. The supply of credit to buy slaves is an example of evidence which doesn't support that idea. So direct purchase turned out to be a major advantage for Glasgow. We'll look at three aspects of this. First, efficiency. Second, advantages to the colonist. And third, France. By accumulating large amounts of tobacco at the storehouses, the leaf could be transported in bulk. The tobacco ship from Europe would arrive, finding a stockpile of tobacco ready for loading. This reduced the amount of time which a ship spent at port, which was known as turnaround. Reducing turnaround made it more likely that the ship could get back to Europe in return for another shipment, which, as mentioned earlier, was crucial for reducing the transport costs of a tobacco firm. In 1750, average turnaround was 53 days. By 1775, this had been reduced to just 33 days. Much of the tobacco which was filling those storehouses came from the smaller scale tobacco planters. These planters had to solve the problem of getting their tobacco from Virginia all the way to the European consumer. The consignment merchants who worked from London wouldn't have made enough revenue for handling small quantities of tobacco across the Atlantic. They did their business with the larger plantations which traded in bigger quantities and which had more credibility. The Glasgow owned storehouses offered to purchase the tobacco directly from these new planters, giving the small scale farmer a source of revenue and freeing them from the risks involved in waiting for their tobacco to turn a profit in Europe. In these storehouses, planters could purchase goods that the tobacco merchants had shipped over from Europe. In place of cash, lines of credit were usually given, which enabled planters to get necessary equipment before harvest. In return, they would agree to sell their crop to the Scottish merchant after the tobacco had actually been grown. The tobacco, now back in Scotland, bought in bulk from a range of planters and now wholly owned by a Glasgow firm, could now be sold at market. A major outlet for Scottish tobacco was France. The setup of the French tobacco market would turn out to be another lucky break in the same way that Scotland's geography was. Throughout the 1700s, all French tobacco imports were handled by a state monopoly called the Farmers General of the French Customs. This entity was massive and was able to pay for goods in cash or with dependable credit. In those days, a lot of business was done on credit, as goods and information moved slowly by sale and by horsepower. It could take a while for hard cash and goods to arrive, so the risk of making a deal only to find that your customer was actually bankrupt was a real threat. Big institutions like the Farmers General had reliable cash at hand, and behind the French Farmers General was massive French demand for tobacco, demand which Scottish-based tobacco houses could tend to meet better than their rivals in London, Liverpool, and Bristol. The consignment houses in London and Bristol, representing a range of planters back in America, could not deliver tobacco in the same quantity and efficiency that Glasgow merchants could. The Glasgow merchants, as mentioned earlier, owned the tobacco they shipped, and so they could offer a uniform quantity and price at large scale. They didn't need to constantly negotiate for a standard which had been set by the planters. That had already been accomplished in the storehouses back in Virginia. Between 1757 and 1762, 52% of Glasgow's tobacco exports were bound for France. Out of statistics like this, the richest businessmen ever seen in Scotland to that date were created. They were known as the Tobacco Lords.
So we've talked a lot about what these men actually did, but where did they come from? And what did they spend their profits on in their spare time? The Burgess Enrollment, which was a member's list for the Merchant Guild from 1730 to 1790, shows that the merchants were not limited to being just from Glasgow, with more merchants actually coming from outside the borough than from it from within. They came from places like Paisley, Edinburgh, and Ayrshire. There's a school of thought that claims that these men, um, that these men's careers were like a rags to riches story, um, where the whole enterprise was built from the ground up. As romantic as this sounds, most of these men were actually from the middle class, which was at the time just a small portion of the population, and these families already had established connections and businesses already. They were also educated men, with at least 68 of the tobacco merchants attending Glasgow University. Um, where they studied under prominent figures like Joseph Black and Adam Smith. Many received an academic education with Latin and classics featuring prominently. The sons of wealthy merchants were also sent to Europe on what was called a grand tour, where they were expected to learn proper etiquette, study languages, and become more travelled and more accustomed to the ways of the world. After this, almost all of them would spend time in America working for the business before starting out in the trade in their own right. So what did they spend their profits on? Fancying themselves great patrons of the arts and the social scenes in Glasgow, they spent the money on rural estates and on entertainment, which included music institutions, theatres and art galleries. In addition to these, Glasgow merchants also spent their time in a gentleman's club called the Hodgepodge Club. Here they would meet up to play cards, eat, drink and above all, bet. Basking in glory, if pleasant, isn't necessarily good for the economy. But luckily, many of the guys who made fortunes in tobacco reinvested their wealth into things like the Fourth Clyde Canal, into processes to create goods for the colonists in America. Due to the demand of material goods from the colonies and the expense that came with importing these from the rest of Europe, the tobacco lords looked to set up their own manufacturing businesses to cater for the bulk and quantity required. Financing local industries such as leather tanning, rope making, boot and shoe making, ironworks, and sugar refining. These helped cut the cost. What you can make locally cuts down on shipping, transportation, and the need to buy materials from elsewhere. The whole dynamic itself provided a kind of new national skill set. It's like Scotland had earned its MBA. Connections had been developed and a commercial acumen refined which could be reapplied into new, unforeseen opportunities that could arise in the future. Glasgow was now home to an ecosystem of firms which owned their own fleet of ships and which were flush with cash for investment both at home and abroad. These would combine to help Glasgow grow from a trade city to an industrial city. This growing complexity and momentum of the Scottish economic scene can be measured by indexes like increasing urbanization in Scotland. Urbanization means essentially the growth of cities. In 1650, 50 years before legal tobacco trade got going in the Clyde, Scotland's share of population described as town dwellers was 16th in Europe more similar to cities in Poland and Scandinavia. By 1750, Scotland's place was seventh, with 9% of the population living in towns with a population of above 10,000. And by 1850, as the economic nutrition from events like success in the tobacco trade compounded and worked its way through the economy, Scotland's place in the Urban Population League was second only to its partner England. In the background, adding momentum to this, were the merchants, sailors, workers, investors, and planters deriving a living from the humble tobacco leaf. And that's all for this episode of the Scottish History Podcast. We hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for listening. And just before we go, just say a massive shout out and thank you to everyone who's downloaded our episodes uh, before this one. Really appreciate it, yeah, guys. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, um, really hope you enjoyed the episodes that you did and the ones we're going to produce in the future. Yeah, and um, feel free to get in touch uh, on Facebook and Twitter and to email us at uh, Scottish History Podcast at gmail.com. See you next time on the podcast. See you later.